Hi. In this video, we're looking at a modified version of problem 6.1.4b from Broverman. Actually, it's just an extension of what's given in that problem. It's about the relationship between the yield of a bond that's got coupons to a term structure, in other words, a set of spot rates that come from zero coupon bonds. That is, well, two situations we're thinking about here. What's given in the book is that the term structure is flat, except for the last spot rate, which happens to be higher than the other ones. Or else, something new that I've added, thinking about a strictly increasing term structure, a strictly increasing yield curve. So here is the problem. You are given the following term structure. These are effective annual interest rates that you see down here. And in this problem, to keep things simple, we're going to assume the coupons are paid annually instead of semi-annually. So you can see the first n minus one of them are all equal, and the last one, Rn, is greater than all the one that pre ones that precede it. These are, again, zero coupon bond maturities up to n years. This would be one year, two years, three years, etc. n minus one years, and n years. These are, again, effective annual interest rates for zero coupon bonds. You would call this a flat term structure except for the n year maturity, which in this case is higher. I could have also, we could have also considered what if it's lower. An n year bond has coupons. It's got an annual coupon rate of R with annual coupons. The goal is to show that the yield to maturity, J, must satisfy the, this set of inequalities. And of course, since Rn minus 1 is equal to all the other Rs before that point, you could put those in here too. But here's some extras that I've added on. For just a little bit more effort, you could also suppose, think about what happens when the term structure is strictly increasing. So you've got strict inequalities all the way along. These numbers keep getting strictly bigger. You can still show that J must satisfy this set of inequalities without much more work. Okay, It's basically the same kind of argument. Also, in this case, we might consider, is J more likely to be closer to R1 or Rn? And I purposely am vague there about what more likely might mean. We'll be thinking intuitively at that point. All right, so what do we have here? Um, the bond could be priced. This coupon, the, the bond with coupons here, could be priced according to two different ways of thinking. Let's, to keep things simple, let's assume that the face amount is 1. Okay, we could assume any face amount. We could keep it in the equations, but just to keep things simple, let's assume the face amount is 1 so that the coupons for this bond with coupons is going to be amount F times R is just going to be R. Okay, R is the annual coupon rate, and they are annual coupons. R is, in fact, going to be the amount of each coupon. For example, if R is 0 0.04, then this coupon amount would be 0 0.04. Let's think about the price of the bond, this bond with coupons, in two ways. You could think about the price in terms of the term structure, in terms of these R's that are up here. Let me go ahead and use summation notation like I did in the last video. If you're uncomfortable with summation notation, maybe you want to watch that last video and just remind yourself what it is. You've got the present value of all the coupon amounts, amount R, so you'd have R times 1 plus R1 to the negative 1 power. You'd also add R plus 1 plus R2 to the negative 2 power, etc. That could be thought of as a summation. Well, with, with R, the coupon amount out in front, R times the sum, K goes from 1 to N, of 1 plus r sub k to the negative k power. Okay, that would be the present value of all the coupons according to this term structure. And again, when k is 1, 2, 3, up through n minus 1, they, those would all be the same. But let me just leave it as an arbitrary rk in there here anyway. That'll help us for the extra part. Okay, that would be the present value of all the coupons discounted according to the term structure. And then you've got the present value of the redemption amount of 1 use Rn. So you'd have 1 plus Rn to the negative n power. Okay, Go ahead and take the time to write this out without a summation symbol if it makes you more comfortable. That's definitely one way we can think about the price. That's how you would think about the price with this, of this bond with coupons in terms of this term structure. By pricing consistency, um, if J is the annual yield for this bond, I could also use J in place of all the RKs. This price should also equal the discounted value of all the coupons and the discounted value of the redemption amount using J, using the yield rate. 
So I could just go ahead and replace each RK with J, including RN, like that. Okay. So now the goal here is to show that these inequalities are true. And probably the most or the nicest way to do that is to argue by contradiction. You want to show J is between these two numbers. Assume to the contrary that it's not between them, that it's either less than this one or greater than this one. Assume to the contrary that j is less than or equal to r sub n minus 1 or bigger than r sub n. I could write that as r sub n is less than or equal to j. Okay, I also could write j is greater than or equal to r sub n. Those are equivalent things. So this is an argument by contradiction. It's a fundamental technique for mathematical proofs. And we are, you could say, essentially doing a proof here and giving an argument why this is true. And then you would just consider each of these cases separately. And the argument is actually pretty simple when you think about it. Um, if j is less than or equal to r sub n minus 1, which again, by the way, is equal to all these other r's that where the subscript comes before n minus 1. I could write this. And I could also say, by the way, since I'm assuming that this is true up here, I could also say that's less than r sub n. I can say, in comparing these things, since j is smaller than all of them, that when I do 1 plus j to the negative k power, or 1 plus j to the negative n power, that I get something bigger, right? 1 plus, you could say 1 plus x to an arbitrary negative power where k itself here is positive is a decreasing function of x. As x gets bigger, this gets smaller. Said another way, as x gets smaller, this thing gets bigger. So if j is less than or, all, or equal to all these things, then strictly less than rn, well, these things are going to be well, at least when k is not equal to n, they're going to be um, greater than or equal to these things. And when k actually equals n, it's going to be a strict inequality. Okay? So because of that, I can say then this expression, r times the summation, k goes from 1 to n, 1 plus j to the negative k plus 1 plus j to the negative n is, in fact, strictly greater than it could be greater than or equal to for the summation when k goes from 1 to n minus 1, but when k is n, both here and here, I could get a strict inequality. I will get a strict inequality here. I can say strictly greater than what I have up here. I'll go ahead and put that in red here instead of switching to blue. But that, right away, is a contradiction. This contradicts what you could call pricing consistency. Consistency. Can I spell consistency? There we go. <clears throat> J, the yield rate, is defined in such a way that these two things are equal. That's its definition. Pricing consistency. These have to be equal. So if this is bigger than that, they're not equal. That's a contradiction. So this possibility is excluded. And the other possibility is pretty much the same argument, except the inequality switches direction. If j is greater than or equal to rn, assuming this case right here, written this way, which is strictly greater than r1 through rn minus 1, which are all equal to each other, Go ahead and use consistent colors here. Then r times the summation, k goes from 1 to n, of 1 plus j to the negative k plus 1 plus j to the negative n is smaller than the other thing. Again, each one of these terms that are being added are decreasing functions of the variable x here. So if j is bigger than or equal to, well, rn and strictly greater than all these other ones, 
that's going to make this whole thing strictly smaller than this thing here. And again, that's a contradiction as well. This contradicts pricing consistency as well. Okay, so it's a fairly simple argument <clears throat> once you think about concepts clearly and set this up. Now, as far as this extra thing goes, um, I'm not going to write anymore, but let me just talk about it. You could you can easily modify what you've got here to deal with this extra situation where we've got this increasing term structure, a strictly increasing, R1 is strictly less than R2, is strictly less than R3, etc. Strictly less than Rn minus 1 is strictly less than Rn. J must be between these two extremes. Okay? You don't know how it's related to R2 through Rn minus 1, but it's definitely strictly between R1 and Rn. And you could argue by contradiction again, you could assume to the contrary that J is less than or equal to, well, instead of Rn minus 1 here, you'd have an R1, or this. In the first case, J would be less than or equal to, since it's less than or equal to R1, it would be less than all the other ones. And then once again, you could say, because j is smaller than all the other ones, that this expression involving the j is bigger than this thing. And that would, again, contradict pricing consistency. On the flip side, if j is greater than or equal to rn, written this way, say, it's pretty much the exact same argument, except you'd use different notation here. You'd say rn is strictly greater than rn minus 1, strictly greater than rn minus 2, etc. You'd still get the conclusion that this thing, because j is greater than all of them, is less than this thing. And again, that would contradict pricing consistency. As far as this intuitive thing that's not real, that's kind of vague there, not real precise, is j more likely to be closer to r1 or rn? I hope you could think about that for a few seconds and come up with the answer. Think about it. You've got the coupon amounts for the bond, which are relatively small compared to the redemption value in general. r is relatively small compared to 1 in general. And because of this pricing consistency, and because of that, the fact that the redemption amount is larger than the coupon amounts, you should expect J to be closer to Rn than it is to R1, okay, in typical situations at least. Okay, J is kind of a weighted average in a sense of the Rs, though you should expect it to be closer to Rn in this situation, well, in general, um, because you've got the most weight coming from the redemption value. Uh, let me say one more thing as I end this video. I would encourage you to realize that you can think about this kind of expression right here uh, in a more abstract way that could allow you to use pretty advanced tools from calculus. And I might do this um, in coming videos. I'm not sure. I might make use of this perspective. You could think of that expression here and I guess, well, it's in other places here and here as well. As a function of n variables, you could call it, for example, f of r1 comma r2 comma r3 comma etc. through rn. Maybe I could even add in another variable, r in there, and maybe even a discrete variable, n if I liked. But let's just go ahead and Think of it as a function of R1 through Rn. Essentially, think of it as a function of the term structure. Um, and you could use ideas from multivariable calculus to analyze this. For example, you could think about what is the partial derivative of this thing with respect to any of these Rs. If I is 1 through n minus 1, the partial derivative of f with respect to Ri would be, thinking about this expression here, uh, I is not n here, so we're not thinking about when k is n here. Um, the only term that involves ri comes from when k is i, and so the derivative would come from just differentiating that piece. All the other things would differentiate to zero. You'd bring the power, negative k, down in front. You'd have a negative k times r times 1 plus rk to the negative k minus 1 power. So I bring that negative k down in front and subtract 1 from the exponent. Oh, excuse me. The k should be an i down there. I could have used a k instead of an i. So that's what would happen if i is 1, 2 through n minus 1. On the other hand, if i is n, if I take the derivative of this with respect to rn, then I've got to include this one as well. And ultimately, that partial derivative would be um, negative, let's see here, got to be careful, uh, 
n 1 plus r 1 plus rn to the negative n minus 1. Okay, so you could think about partial derivatives. You could therefore think about rates of change of the price based on the term structure for changes in the individual spot rates. That might be an interesting thing to think about um, and something that could be useful. All right, have a good day. Thanks for watching the video.